Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age 2 Codex reading. Now, I think it, I'm thinking of the best way to split this up, and I think at the end of every act and every DLC, we'll go through all the new codexes that we've unlocked. Now, this is a pretty much 100% run that we're doing, so should get most of the codexes, but yeah, we might miss one or two here or there if they're like if they're on a shelf that you don't go to or something like that. But it's fairly complete, so let's get started. Let's start with the uh, creatures. We've got a couple of different categories. We've got creatures, we've got items, places, lore, characters, letters and notes. I think we've read most letters and notes, but we'll look at them again. I think Art of War's tutorials? Uh, yeah, Art of War's tutorials. So we're not going to read the tutorials. We'll just uh, get rid of uh, all the marks on them so it doesn't light up anymore. And then we'll look at things. So yeah, I think letters and notes and notes we might have read, but it'll probably pop up if we read it. I don't know. If it seems like it's not important, we'll just ignore it. Abomination. We arrived in the dead of night. We had been tracking the malefic car for days and finally had him cornered. Or so we thought. As we approached, a home at the edge of the town exploded, sending splinters of wood and fist-sized chunks of rock onto our ranks. We had but moments to regroup before the fire rained from the sky and the sounds of the destruction wrapped in hideous laughter from the centre of the village. They're there. Perched across atop the spire of the village chantry stood the mage, but he was human no longer. We shouted prayers to the maker and deflected what magic we could, but as we fought, the creature fought harder. I saw my comrades fall, burned by the flaming sky or crushed by the debris. The monstrous creature, looking as if a demon was wearing a man with like a twisted suit of skin, spotted me and grinned. We had forced it to this, I realized. The mage had made this pact, given himself over to the demon to survive our assault. Transcribed from a tale told by a former Templar in Cumberland, 884 Blessed. It is known that mages are able to walk the Fade while completely aware of their surroundings, unlike most who uh, may only enter the realm as dreamers and leave scarcely aware of their existence. Demons are drawn to mages, though whether it is because of this awareness or simply by virtue of their magical power is in our world is unknown. Regardless of the reason, a demon always attempts to possess a mage when it encounters one, by force or by making some kind of deal, depending on the strength of the mage. Should the demon get the upper hand, the result is an unholy union known as an abomination. Abominations have been responsible for some of the worst cataclysms in history. The notion that some mage in a remote tower could turn into such a creature unbeknownst to any was the driving force behind the creation of the Circle of Magi. Thankfully, abominations are rare. The Circle has methods for weeding out those who are too at risk for dem demonic possession, and scant few mages would give up their free will to submit to such a bond with a demon. Once an abomination is created, it will do its best to create more. Considering that entire squads of Templars have been known to fall at the hands of a single abomination, it is not surprising that the Chantry takes the business of the Circle of Magi very serious indeed. So yeah, this is an interesting codex entry, because it says uh, things like, um, by force of making some kind of deal. This uh, reminds me a lot of Anders, who has the Spirit of Justice inside him. This could... Uh, it, it's kind of like he's an abomination, but it's a little bit different. It's uh, still interesting what he is. Anyway, Arcane Horror. Upon ascending to the second floor of the tower, we were greeted by a gruesome sight. A ragged collection of bones wearing the robes of one of the senior enchanters. I had known her for years, watched her raise countless apprentices, and now she was a mere puppet for some demon. Transcribed from a tale told by a Templar in Antiva City, 713 Storm. Demons, of course, have no form in our world. When they enter, either, what, either where the veil is particularly thin or through blood magic summoning, they must take possession of a body. When a pride demon takes control of a corpse of a mage, an arcane horror is born. Although they appear to be little more than bones, these fierce creatures possessing... Uh, not only all the spellcasting abilities of a living mage, but also the capacity to heal and even command other animated corpses. Oh, I didn't know Arcane Horrors could heal. Useful information. To any who doubts the wickedness of blood magic, I say, with your own hand, strike down the corpses of your brothers who have fallen in battle to a Maleficar, then we may discuss morality. Knight Commander Benedictus, in a letter to the Divine, 546 Exalted. The walking dead are not, as the superstitious are wont to believe, the living come back for revenge. They are rather corpses possessed by demons. 
The shambling corpse, controlled by a demon of sloth, causes its enemies to become weak and, and uh, fatigued. Corpses possessed by rage demons go berserk and simply wade into their opponents mindlessly. Devouring corpses are held by hunger demons and feed upon the living. The more powerful demons rarely deign to possess a dead host. Okay. Desire demon. In all my studies, I must say the most intriguing was my interview with a desire demon. The creature was willing to speak with me. Uh, that that the quiller creature was willing to speak with me is a sign that there was, this was no mere monster driven by its nature, but rather a rational being as interested in me as I was in it. It took a form that I would call female, though I had no doubt it could appear otherwise. I wondered if it appeared as it did because I wanted it to, or because I expected it to. She, and indeed I could only think of her as such now smiled warmly at me and laughed at a musical sound that seemed to thrill my old heart. So frightened I was of this creature's legendary, legendary abilities to twist the hearts of men, and so relieved was I when I looked across the table into her dark eyes. This was a fearsome creature of the Fade, but as I spoke with her, I slowly came to realise this demon was merely as misunderstood as we mages are ourselves. From the journal of Senior Enchanter, Malleus, once of the Circle of Rivalen, the cleared apostate 920 dragon. Now before we finish this, this sounds a lot more like Anders. This sounds um, very much like Anders, but it may also sound like this mage was being tricked. Depending on your point of view. Of all the threats from beyond the veil, few are more insidious and deceptively deadly than the Desire Demon. In folklore, such demons are characterised as peddlers of lust luring their prey into a sexual encounter only to be slain at the culmination. While a desire demon can indeed deal in pleasure, in truth they deal in any member of desire that humans possess, wealth, power, beauty to name a few. Far more intelligent than the bestial hunger and rage demons, and more ambitious than the demons of sloth, these dark spirits are among the most skilled at tempting mages into possession. Many who serve the whims of a desire demon never realise it. They are manipulated by illusions and deceit, if not outright mind control. Although these demons are reluctant to resort to such crude methods, instead they seem to take great pleasure in corruption. The greater the deceit, the greater the victory. See, maybe it's saying um, a desire a human can possess. Maybe a desire for justice? See, I think just justice, you could see it as a desire demon and not a spirit, depending on your point of view. Only demons of pride prove more fearsome opponents when roused. Their abilities to affect the mind allow them to assume disguises and even alter the environment to their purposes. Not to mention the great strength and speed they possess if, um, if they should not resort to more physical means. Most often a desire demon will attempt to bargain its way to freedom if overpowered. Many stories exist that depict mages defeating desire demons to the point where a wish can be wrested from them. It should be noted that in such stories, the demon almost always gets the upper hand, even when the mage thinks his wish has been granted. So kind of like uh, genies. Dragons. Well, dragon. Dragon lynx. Newly hatched dragons are roughly the size of a deer and voraciously hungry. They live for a short time in their mother's lair before venturing out on their own. The slender, wingless creatures are born in vast numbers and as only a few make it to adulthood. Probably because we killed them all. Next one. Golem. Once a crucial part of Orzammar's defences, golems have all but vanished as a secret to their manufacture was lost over a thousand years ago. While a few golems remain are guarded closely by the Shaper, brought out when battle with the Darkspawn grows desperate enough to risk their loss. No one would now sell a golem for any price, but in ancient times dwarfs sold many golems to the Magister Lords of Devinter. They were devastating weapons in war, living siege engines capable of hurling boulders like catapult or plowing through enemy lines like an earthquake. Uh, don't really have much to say about golems. Herlocks, taller than their genlock cousins, the Herlocks are roughly human sized but possess considerable strength and constitution. The shock troop of the Darkspawn, a single berserking Herlock, can often be a match for numerous opponents at once. They are known to adorn themselves in roughly carved tattoos to, make, uh, to keep track of their kills and deeds, though it is unknown whether or not there is a uniform standard to these markings. Mabari Warhound. Dogs are an essential part of Ferelden culture, and no dog is more prized than the Mabari. The breed is as old as myth said to have been bred from wolves who serve the Dane. Prized for their intelligence and loyalty, these dogs are more than mere weapons or status symbols. These hounds choose their masters and pair with them for life. To be the master of a Mabari anywhere in Ferelden is to be instantly recognised as a person of worth. 
the Mabari are an essential part of Ferelden military strategy. Trained hounds can easily pull knights on horseback or break lines of pikemen. The sight and sound of wave of war of a wave of war dogs howling and snarling has been known to cause panic amongst even the most hardened infantry soldiers. So yeah, this is like Mutt, our dog. Although our dog doesn't seem to be quite as uh, useful as the dogs that they're talking about. Ogre. Towering over the darkspawn kin, the massive ogres are as rare as sight on the battlefield. Traditionally, they only appear during the blight, but some records claim that ogres have been spotted in the deep roads hunting alone or in small groups. At least one report by Grey Warden claims that an ogre was spotted in the Kakari Wilds in 919 Dragon, although it was weakened and easily dispatched. Up to a hundred of these creatures can accompany a darkspawn horde at any one time during a blight, often using their great strength to burst through fortifications and demolish the front lines of an opposing army. They use brute force to charge their enemies like bulls, slam them to the ground with their fists and shake enemies off their feet, and hurl giant rocks into the face of oncoming foes. Melee can be difficult against a giant that snatches a warrior up in one hand, crushing the life out of him or beating him into oblivion with the other hand. The nimble can try and wiggle his way free, or an ally can attempt to array of stunning blows on an ogre to free the comrade in danger. Grey Warden lore urges caution when slaying an ogre. Unless it's ensured they've received a major wound to the head or to the heart, it's possible they are lying dormant and will regenerate to full health within a matter of minutes. During a blight, most Grey Wardens recommend burning all darkspawn to ashes. Dead ogres in particular. Interesting. Didn't know that ogres could regenerate. That's kind of interesting uh, information to know. The Profane. We who are forgotten. Remember, we claw at rock until our fingers bleed. We cried out for justice, but were unheard. Our children wept in hunger, and so we feasted upon the gods. Here we wait in aeons of silence. We few, we profane. Found scribbled on the wall in the lost Ravain Tag by explorer Vamur Helma, 510 Exalted, unknown author. So these are the um, rock race that um, have a hunger for the red lyrium. At least that's what it seemed like. Yeah, they're interesting. I wonder if we're going to know more about them or whether that's all we get to know. Rage Demon. Encountered in the Fade, the true form of a Rage Demon is a frightening sight. A thing of pure fire, the body seems seemingly made of amphimorphous lava. Its eyes, two pinpricks of baneful light uh, irradiating from its core. The abilities of such a demon center on the fire it generates. It burns those who come near, and the most powerful its kind are able to lash out with bolts of fire and fi even firestorms that can affect entire areas. Fortunately, even powerful rage demons are less intelligent than other vari of other varieties. Their tactics are simple. Attack an enemy uh, on sight with much force as possible until it perishes. Some rage demons can carry over their heat-based abilities into possessed hosts, but others, otherwise the true form is mainly seen outside of the Fade when it's specifically summoned by a mage to do his bidding. Revenant. An entire unit of men, all slain by one creature. I didn't believe it at first, your perfection, but it appears that it is so. We have a survivor, and while at first I thought his ranting's pure exaggeration, it seems to be no simple skeleton. The descriptions of the creature's abilities were eerily similar to those that uh, our brothers at Maris Pal encountered almost a century ago. Men pulled through the air to skewer themselves on the creature's blade. An attack so quick it was able to assault multiple points at once. Know your perfection. What we have in here is indeed a revenant and nothing less. A letter to Divine Amar, the third, 571 Exalted. A revenant is a corpse possessed by a demon of pride or of desire. Make it amongst the most powerful possessed opponents that one can face. Many possess spells, but most are armed and armored and prefer the use of their martial talents. They are weak against physical attacks but regenerate quickly. Commonly use telekinesis to pull opponents into melee range should they try to flee. Revenants also have the ability to strike multiple opponents surrounding them. Stay at range if possible and strike quickly. That is the only way to take such a creature down. Now this is interesting because the revenants in Origin you found by breaking a phylactery or what looked like or a vial, and that would summon the revenant. But if a revenant is a corpse possessed, surely the corpse would have to be in the same room. Or maybe there are multiple ways, or maybe the revenants have some kind of teleportation or something. I don't know. It's interesting. Rock Wraith. 
20 years in Legion of the Dead. I've seen spiders larger than Bronto, brood, brood, uh, brood mothers lounging in pru, uh, putrescent, surrounded by their corrupted children, and unnamed things with flesh turned against itself. But worse, by far was an old mineshaft down from a head rune tag. We chased, we chased an emissary down there into a tunnel dead-ended in rubble. It was a vicious fight. He picked up I picked my men off until only four of us were left. It seemed like we'd finally fulfill our oaths. Our fight woke something long dormant. What I thought was rubble gathered beneath my feet, taking a terrible form. A beast of stone surrounding the shattered skeleton of man, a rock wraith. The spirit of a dwarf so foul that the stone itself rejected him. One swing of its boulder hand crushed the emissary, and when it turned its eyeless skull towards us, we fled back up the tunnel, its heavy footsteps thundering at our backs. When we reached the tag, we finally turned, knowing that out in the open we had no cover and couldn't hope to outrun the wraith. When it came to the exit, it stuck the trusses holding up the ceiling of the, shra of the shaft, closing itself in forever. Perhaps in the end it felt remorse, perhaps it was one lost soul recognising another. From the journals of Amrun, Legion of the Dead. Now as we know, this is complete superstition, like it being a dwarf uh, spirit or whatever. It was a hunger demon. We knew this because it hungered for the profane's, like, it was feeding off the profane's hunger. Or at least that's what I remember it being. Wait, unless the rock wave was the other one. I don't know, there were multiple rock waves, I think. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it was a dwarven spirit. I don't think it was, though. Shade. It's often been suggested that the only way for a demon to affect the world of living is by possessing the a living or once living body. This is not always true. Indeed, a shade is one such creature, a demon of true form that is adapted to affect the world around it. My hypothesis is this. We already know that many demons have become become confused when they pass through the veil into our world. They are unable to tell the living from the dead. The very static nature of our universe being confusing to a creature that is accustomed to a physically defined entire a physicality defined entirely by emotion and memory. Most demons seek to immediately seize upon anything they perceive as life, jealous, attempted to possess it. But what of those that do not? What of those that encounter no life or fail to possess a body? What of those that are more cautious by their nature? These demons watch. They lurk. They envy. In time, such a demon will learn to drain energy from the psyche of those it encounters just as it did in the Fade. Once it has drained enough, it has the power to manifest and will forever be known as a shade. So it's like creature spurns possession, instead floats as a shadow across its piece of land, preying upon the psyche of any who pop across its path. Perhaps it believes itself still in the fade. There is evidence to believe this is so. A shade will weaken the living by its very proximity. If it focuses its will, it can drain a single target very quickly. Some have even been known to assault the minds of a living victim, causing confusion or horror or making the target right for the kill. The tragedy of a shade is perhaps that once it has drained its target as a whole, its appetite is only heightened rather than slaked. Uh, from the journal of former senior enchanter Malleus, one of the Circle of Rivian declared apostate in 920 Dragon Age. I'm wondering whether we met Malleus in... Uh, in one of the uh, games. I don't know if you ever meet him. But it sounds like he was doing a lot of experiments trying to understand demons, while a lot of mages don't. Interesting. Giant spider. Giant spiders tend to appear in old runes and other places where the veil has become thin because of magical disturbances or a great number of deaths. In such places, spirits and demons pass into the world of living and attempt to control living beings, spiders among them. Not all scholars accept this explanation for the presence of these beasts, however. Some claim that the veil allows magic to leak from the fade, tainting such creatures as spiders to transform into larger, more potent creatures than they ever would become naturally. While such spiders are known to possess powerful poisons, the ability to fling their webs at opponents in combat, studies of them have been few and the range of their abilities are unknown. They are awful. That's all the creatures. We have a few items here. Talisman of Sarabars, a simple shape on a leather on a, a leather cord. The uneven polish is not a failure of workmanship, rather than a result of extracting and repeatedly study by powerful hands. Black glimmers curl just beneath a surface that should be solid, and there are glimpses of a core that seem to be carved from a piece of horn. Gaze for more than a moment, and it seems to stir something in an uncommonly dark corner of the mind, coaxing out a familiar primal want. It is impossible to say whether Sarabaris intended this as a reinforcement or restriction. At the moment, it simply is. The secret thing was never meant for the eyes of another. Interesting. 
The Spiral Eye. Kirkpool has been a tinderbox since the, uh, becoming the centre of the Templar power in Eastern Thedas. One of the hundred... Oh, no, of the hundreds of mages that live in the gallows, it is perhaps telling that the most well-known is are its apostate. Seredwith was one such infamous apostate. She lived during the latter half of the Storm Age and was known for hunting priests and Templars that abused the charges excessively. Seredwith was known as the Watcher and the Spiral Eye, so named for the spiraled lift she marked her near her victims. Templar records show that Seredwith was captured and made tranquil in 790 Storm. Many refuse to believe this, so her legend lives on. From Kirkwall, the City of Chains by Brother Jenna TV, 924 Dragon. Now this is the uh, item set we have on, so we're having on this uh, Seraweth's items. So it's kind of cool to know where it came from. Val de Sin. In ancient days before the Darkspawn, the dwarven cities wound through the roots of all the earth. House of Val de Sin single-handedly kept the Empire supplied with Lyrium. One day the mining family shite shut the doors of their tyke. They spoke not to their noble patrons nor to their king, and not even a visiting paragon. Days passed in silence before the doors to Vaseline Tag opened. Anxious partners discovered it empty. Not one soul remained, no bodies, and no sign of what had happened. House Valdesen left only a staff of strange metal behind. It looked like Lyrium and chilled one's heart like a remembered sorrow. The king sealed the staff inside the tag and no dwarf ever ventured there again, as recounted as recounted by Shaper Myrtle. Interesting. I wonder what happened. I guess they maybe... Maybe the dwarfs got... Like, used their bodies to create... Like, their... They did some magic? The dwarfs don't do magic. They can't do magic. I don't know. Maybe it's a weird crafting thing. Like, how the dwarfs crafted themselves into the golems. You know, something like that. The Far Cliffs of Kirkwall. Written by a Ferelden refugee as she fled the Blight, this book of poems describes her dreams of a start in Kirkwall, the city across the sea. Reader, uh, readers will surely be enriched by her insights. Of Things Not Lost, written by a Ferelden refugee as she fled the Blight, this book of poems describes her struggle to preserve her past and cling to the few physical mementos she brought with her into a foreign land. Will it, readers will find this book enchanting. Lothering's Lament, written by a Ferelden refugee as she fled, fled the Blight, this book of poems contains touching reminiscences of all she had to leave behind. Readers will surely benefit from her experience. Interesting, I have no idea what those are, but they're in they're interesting. Oh, wait, I know what those are. Those are the DLC items. Oh, right, that's that's what they are. It's um the chests, they had a uh, bits of loot in them. Okay, we've got a lot of places to do. Um, just seeing how much we've got. Ooh, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep, cool. Yeah, I think we can continue on. Places. The Anderfells. The Anderfells are a land of shocking extremes. It's the most desolate place in all the world, for two blights have left the great expanses of the steppes so completely devoid of life that the corpses cannot even decay there. No insect or grub will ever reach them. It is land filled with wonders like the Miradine, with its gigantic white statue of Our Lady carved into its face, her hands outstretched and bearing an eternal flame. A wise up fortress of its walls of living rock towering over the desolate plains below. The Anders too are people of extremes, the most devout priests and the most deadly soldiers, the poorest nations in the world and the most feared. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Jenna TV. Uh, I don't remember what the Anderfells were. I don't think we've ever been there. So, don't have much to add. Uh, Kirkwall, the Elven Alienage. Lowtown is home to a squalid Elven Alienage. Here is the mo Here, like in most Thedas Alienages, elves are packed into tiny rundown apartments and effectively segregated from a human population. Kirkwall's Alienage is even more dilapidated than the rest of Lowtown, but the elves go to great lengths keeping the place looking bright and festive. The Venadal tree of the people standing in the middle of the Aeonage is a sign for elven pride and shared cultural identity is lovingly cared for. It is difficult to say if the elves would continue combining themselves to the Aeonage if they were given a chance to mingle. They may not admit it, but some feel that living among their kind is far better than living with humans, no matter how terrible Aeonage life may be. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, Tales of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Jeb Yenna TV. It's interesting seeing this one. You can kind of see how, because Brother Jenna TV is a human, you got a little bit more. You got the, uh, like, when you're speaking to the elves in the alienage, quite a lot of them would like to not live there. 
Brother Jan TV is like, eh, it's not, it's not too bad. But it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. The, that some of these uh, codexes have uh, quite a, like, easy to see bias. Kirkwall Darktown. Darktown was once a mine controlled by the Tevinter Imperium. Once exhausted, the mine shafts were extended under the city to dispose of sewage from Kirkwall's overcrowded population of slaves. Unsurprisingly, the tunnels became refuge for those fleeing captivity. A similar trend continues today. The Undercity, as some call it, is home to disease, the insane, to criminals, to even the dead. Unwanted corpses of those discarded here by murderers or lazy undertakers. Dark Town slums make Low Town look pleasant in comparison. The foul miasma known as Choke Damp clogs and swells every corner of Dark Town, creating a poisonous mist. Its sewers are a dangerous place. The walls are damp, slick, coated with a phosphorescent lichen. The sewers major one foolish enough to enter is not likely to be heard from again. Again from Brother Jenna TV. Yeah, I didn't realise that Dark Town was literally a sewer. That makes it seem a lot worse. You, you don't really get that impression. Kirkwall Hightown. At the height of the Tevinter Imperium slave trade, Kirkwall's elite prospered beyond dreams of avarice. Hightown was built for the wealthiest slavers, its lit sea mansions rising atop a great wall of rock that borders on one side the Waking Sea. Lowtown cowers on the other side until Kirkwall's slaves rose to plunder and destroy Hightown's riches. Today, Hightown's prominent buildings are the keep. Home to the ruling Viscount and the Chantry, home to the Grand Clerk and the city's religious centre, both are converted estates that once housed wealthy magisters, rebuilt and converted after the uprising. Alright, so it's interesting to see what happened after the slave rebellion. Uh, Kirkwall Lowtown. Lowtown sits in the massive cauldron pit sh uh, shaped pit that was once uh, Kirkwall's first quarry. The district was constructed by slaves who carved the city and its labours out of rock, its harbour out of rock. Today, Lowtown is a labyrinth of shantytowns, corridors, and hex hexagonal courtyards. Hex is in the local parlance. Lowtown's poorest live in caves hewn out of the cliff face. The district is shoddily built and bears... Uh, I was thinking that that was saying bear scar something, and that's why I got a little bit put off there. And bear scars of uh, caused by collapsing walls. Foundry smoke smothers the area. Only cold winter only a cold winter storm clears the air, but the icy wind howling over the mouths of old mine shafts hardly counts as relief. Occasionally these dark spawn shafts erupt with gouts of foul air known as choke damp. It's not uncommon to find whole slums silently suffocate, frozen in the midst of everyday activity. The walls surrounding Lowtown are the high highest by the harbour. Its busy street leads up to Hightown, where the wealthiest Kirkwallers perch. When one stands in Lowtown, all one sees other than the rocky walls is high town. It glitters overhead, always in sight, yet always beyond reach. Oh, so it looks like this uh, choke damp thing isn't just a, a dark town thing. It's a low town thing as well. I guess Kirkwall's just an awful place to live. The city of Kirkwall. Kirkwall once lived on the edge of the Devinter Imperium and was home to nearly a million slaves. Sold from elven lands or shipped across the sea, uh, from across the sea, all slaves fed the Imperium's unquenchable thirst for expansion. They worked in massive quarries and sweltering foundries that produced stone and steel for the Empire. The city's complicated past is not easy to forget. History having earmarked many corners of the stone city, a ship approaching from uh, the harbour spots the city's namesake, an imposing black wall. It is visible for miles and carved into the cliff side are a pantheon of vile guardians representing the old gods. Over the years, the Chantry has effaced many of the profane sentinels, but it will take many more years to erase them all. Also carved into the cliff is a channel that permits ships into the city's interior. Flank the channel are two massive bronze statues, the twins of Kirkwall. The statues have a practical use. The Kirkwall sits uh, next to the narrowest point of the Waking Sea. A massive chain net can be erected between the statues and the lighthouse, closing off only narrow navigate, closing off only the narrow naviga navigable lane. The stranglehold, the stranglehold is on sea traffic is jealously guarded by the ever, uh, uh, the ever changing rulers of the city. As the next toll taxes, to um, as the next trolls, as the net trolls taxes, tolls, and extortions from the sea. That is a tongue twister. Trolls, taxes, and tolls. Yeah. Brother Jenna TV, of course. I think he's probably going to do all of these. Navara. 
Navarre. The fourth time I attempted to cross the border into Navarre from Orléans was and was turned back by Chevaliers. I decided to take a more roundabout path, a ship back to Ferelden and then another to Navarre. The outcome was more was uh, more than worth the trouble. The country is filled with artist, uh, artistry, from statues of heroes that litter the streets in even the meanest villages to the glittering golden sit, uh, college of magi in Cumberland. Perhaps nowhere is more astonishing than the vast necropolis outside Navarre City. Unlike most followers of Andraste, the Navarians do not burn their dead. Instead, they carefully preserve the bodies and seal them in elaborate tombs. Some of the wealthiest Navarans begin construct, uh, construction of their own tombs while quite young, and these become incredible palaces, complete with gardens, bathhouses, and ballrooms, utterly silent, kept only for the dead. Hmm. Okay. Olesian Empire. There are many lords and ladies in Val Royal. I mean this literally. Once the system of noble titles in Orle, once the system of noble titles in Orle was labyrinthine. There were many barons and baronesses and baronets and sub barons and a horde of others, each with their own origins and own nu nuances of comparison. The Elysian ar aristocracy is ancient and given to competition. All the nobility play the grand game as it is known, whether they wish to or not, it is a game of reputation and patronage where the moves are made with rumours and scandal as its chief weapon. No gentle game this. More blood has been drawn as a result of the grand game than any war their legions have fought. Of this I am assured by uh, almost every gentleman here. Oh, I've lost where I was. As far as titles uh, went, everything changed with the coming of the Empire of the Emperor Draken. Who established the Elysian Empire as it exists now and who created the Chantry. There is no more venerated figure in Orle, in Val Royo. The statue of Draken stands as tall as the statue of Randraste. Draken determined that the Grand Game was tearing Orle apart, so he abolished all titles besides his own and Lord and Lady. I'm told, with twittering amusement, that this action did not end the Grand Game as Draken had intended. Now all the Lords and Ladies simply collected unofficial titles rather than official ones, such as the exalted patron of Cassis Clay or uncle to the champion of Trems. It is a headache to remember such titles, and one winces to think of the poor doorman at balls who must wrap them off as each guest enters the room. The aristocracy is different from Ferelden in many other ways as well. The Elysian's right to rule stems directly from the maker. There exists neither the concept of rule by merit, nor the slightest notion of rebellion. If one is not noble, one aspires to be, or at least aspires to be in good graces of a noble, and is ever watching for a way to enter the patronage of those better placed in the grand game. Then there are the masks and the cosmetics. I have not seen so much paint since the kennels at high ever, but that is another story. Oh, this one was not by Brother Genitive, this was by Banteric of Westhill. Interesting. Parvalon, the Occupied North. In the 30th year of Steel Age, the first Canary ships were sighted off the coast of Parvalon in the far north, making the beginning of a new age of warfare. History calls this first Canary calls this the first Canary War, but it was more a one-sided bloodbath, while the Canary advancing far into the mainland. Canary warriors in glittering steel armor carved through armies of ease. Their cannons, the likes of which our ancestors have never seen, reduced city walls to rubble in a matter of seconds. Stories of Canary occupation vary greatly. It is said they dismantled families and sent captives to learning camps for indoctrination into their religion. Those who refused to cooperate disappeared into mines or construction camps. For every tale of suffering, however, there is another enlighten another of enlightenment, deriving from something called the Kun. This is either a philo philosophical code or a written text that governs all aspects of Canary life, perhaps both. One converted Sirhen reported pity for those who refused to embrace the Kuhn, as if the conquerors had led him to a sort of self-discovery. For all my life I had followed the Maker, I followed the Maker wherever his path led me, he wrote. But in the Kuhn I have found the means to travel my own path. It has, been, it has been said that the most complete way to wipe out a people is not with blades but with books. Thankfully a world that has repelled blights would not be so easily... Uh, thankfully a world that has repelled four blights would not easily bow to a, fo a foreign aggressor, so the exalted marches began. The greatest advantage of the Chantry-led forces was the Circle of Magi. For all the technology, the Canaries seemed to harbour a great hatred of magic. Faced with cannons, the Chantry was fond of lightning and fire balls of fire. The Canary armies lacked the sheer numbers of humanity, so many were slain at Ma uh, Marnus uh, Pell on both sides. 
that the veil is said to be permanently sundered. The ruins are still played by restless corpses, but each year the chantry pushes further and further into Canary lines. Although local converts to the Kuden proved to uh, uh, proved difficult to return to Andraste's teachings. By the end of the Storm Age, the Canary were truly pushed back. Ravain was the only uh, human land that retained the Canary religion after being freed, and his rulers attempted to barter a peace. Most human lands signed the Lamorian Accord, excepting the Tevinter. Uh, excepting the Dimitri Imperium. It is a shaky piece that has lasted to this day. From the Exalted March's Examination of Chantry Warfare by Sit uh, Sister Petrine Chantry Scholar. Now this is interesting. It shows us a little bit about um, how why the Canari are a little bit hated and why the Canari are very mistrusted. I mean this is from the Chantry perspective as well so it's not giving me a fair you know, in calling it indoctrination camps and things like that. It's not a fear that he's very biased, but yeah, it's interesting. Where was the thing I was wanting to? Yeah, uh, it was Reve. In fact, it was Reveian. This is where the uh, mage who was doing all the experiments was as well. Uh, I'm just wondering what the timeline was. He just doesn't give a timeline. It just says uh, 30th year of the Steel Age, which I don't know off by heart. So uh, it'd be interesting to see if someone's got a. If anyone's ever made a timeline of all of these events, so that you can kind of read through them in order. Anyway, uh, the primeval tag, Your Majesty. It's difficult getting a straight answer out of the scavenger. These sods get themselves so blighted they can't think straight, much less uh, keep spit in their mouth. He says, however, that he's gone down to parts of the deep road that are so old our people forgot them long before the blights even happened. The blight even happened. He spoke of great statues and temples. Temples! He spoke of things that could only be made of magic and impossible runes untouched by Darkspawn. He described creatures, the likes of which we've never seen. It is possible, of course. I've conferred with, Shaper, he, with the Shaper, and he says the memories date back to the founding of the first tag. What could have come before that? Yes, we're unable to explore these depths the scavenger spoke of because uh, of the Darkspawn, but surely the memories to speak of such places if they existed. Yet in the scavenger's belongings, amidst all the filth, there was a single idol. It was clearly of dwarven make, but not resembling any paragon on record, the idol was dressed in a manner I've never seen. The shape of memories could not identify it, nor or the substance uh, from which it was made. The thought that the memories might be wrong is unsettling. An excerpt from a report sealed in Orzammar Royal Archives by King Andalar uh, Gendelblade in 848 Blessed. So this um, idol that they found sounds very similar to the idol that um, Bartrand found. So that we could find out more about that in a bit. The city of Starkhaven. Starkhaven, the largest city in the Free Marches, sits on the bank of the great uh, Minotaur River. I remember my visit to the city quite clearly. I was taken up the river by barge, a cumbersome vessel that moved at a stately pace and uh, disembarked by the city central square, an impressive space of marble fountains surrounded by kingly estates. Starkhaven's wealth was truly a sight to behold, a path paved in granite, in granite led up to the grandest building I've ever seen. My guide indicated that it was the resident, uh, residence of Starkhaven's ruler, Prince Vale. We supped at the table of my guide's closest friend. I was presented with a variety of dishes from the region, one in particular stood out. Fish and egg pie, Starkhaven's most famous dish. Three deboned fish, caught just that day, were cooked in a porcelain vessel with boiled eggs, dried fruit, spices, and a thickened cream, all topped with a light crust. Superb. Brother Jenna TV seems like this one was more of a tourist trip, although a lot of his trips are. Thunder Mount. Kirkwall is guarded by the mountain to its north, the tallest of which, uh, by its mountains to the north, the tallest of which is Thunder Mount. The mountain has a fearsome reputation. Legend says it was the site of a final battle between the Tevinter Imperium of Old and the ancient Empire of Elves that perished with uh, Arlathan. Both sides unleashed horrors into the waking world. The fade creatures prowl the heights this very day. Unaware of the war for which they were summoned was long over. There is a tale in the Free Marches that Blessed and Raste, upon returning to Kirkwall for armies, sojourned up the slopes of Sundermount alone. She stayed there three days. When she returned, she wept as if her heart was broken. I stayed two months in Kirkwall, and despite my best efforts, I have never found a guide willing to take me up the mountain. 
Oh, okay. So this explains why there's so many uh, undead on top of that mountain. As I was wondering, like, it, it didn't seem like there should be, but... Okay. The Tevinter Imperium. For good or ill, the Imperium has put its stamp on Thetis forever. The old Imperial Highway is still in use across most of Thetis. The ruins of the Tevinter Fortresses and centres of magical study still litter a landscape long after the glory of the Imperium dimmed. But the influence of the ancient empire goes deeper than this. Without Tevinter, there would be no Blights, no Andrassi, no Chantry. Every aspect of our world would be altered. The mighty majesty of the Imperium may have faded, but it still makes its presence known, even in the most distant corners of Thedas. Every child has been brought up on stories of Tevinter as it is now, a decadent nation ruled by the Archon and his court of magisters. Great, and no doubt corrupt mage lords. Their chantry is a mockery of our own. Their black divine man chosen from the ranks of the Minrath, this circle of magi. The maker's most hallowed law, magic exists to serve man and never rule over him, perverted. Mages and Imperium say their most sacred duty is to serve man, and they serve best by wielding political power. And the worst, uh, that which Blessed Andrassi must weep to see, all of it is built on a foundation of slavery. While most nations forbid the buying and selling of slaves within their own borders, nearly everyone ships their people to the Imperium for sale, skirting the prohibitions against such atrocities and feeding the Imperium's endless hunger for bodies. To fight the Canari, to work the mines and the quarries, to build the palaces of the magisters, to sweep the crumbling streets and to turn the middens and serve at the whim of their mage overseers. From Black City, Black Divine, uh, and this is Sister Petrine. So again, it's not a... F she's uh, another... she's a Chantry person, so it's not going to be a fair assessment of the Twinter Imperium, but it is interesting to see that they're still fighting the Canari. I wonder how much the fight... it doesn't really... you don't really get to hear much of how the fighting is going, like... Are they having big battles? Is it just skirmishes? Is it a small raiding? Is it kind of like just a war in name only? Like, we're at war, but not actually ever actually going to, not ever actually fighting, that kind of, kind of cold war. Anyway, Geography of Thedas. Thedas is bound to the east by t uh, the Amaranthine Ocean, to the west by the Tirishan Forest, and the Hunter Horn Mountains to the south by the sl uh, snowy wastes that lie beyond the Orkney Mountains and to the north by Dornak Forest. The world Thedas is Tevinter in origin. The word Thedas is Tevinter in origin. Originally used to refer to lands that bordered the Imperium. As the Imperium lost its stranglehold on the conquered nations, more and more lands became Thedas until eventually people applied the name to the entire continent. The northern part of Thedas is divided amongst the Anderfels, the Tevinter Imperium, uh, um, Antiva and Rivian, with the islands held by the Canari just off the coast. Central Thedas consists of the Free Marches, Navarre and Orle with Ferelden's to the south. What lies beyond the, snow, uh, the snowy waste is a mystery. The freezing tempers, uh, temperatures and the barren lands have kept even the most intrepid cartographers at bay. Similarly, the western reaches of the Anderfels has never fully been fully explored even by the Anders themselves. We do not know if the dry steppes are shadowed by mountains or if they extend all the way to a nameless sea. There must be other lands, continents or islands, perhaps across the Amaranthino north of Parvalon, for the Canary arrived uh, in Thedas from somewhere. But beyond that deduction, we know nothing. Okay, so nobody really knows where the Canary are from except the Canary, and they're not, they're not talking. They're war people. Hmm. The Kakari Wilds. It is said that in the midst of the Black Age, when werewolves stalked the lands of Ferelden in numbers that kept every farmholder indoors and a hound on every doorstep, a powerful Arl of the Am Alamari people people stood and declared that you put an end to the threat. As Arling stood on the border of the Dark Forest to the southern border, or border of the Ferelden Valley, and he claimed that the werewolves used the forest to launch their midnight assaults on humanity. For twenty years as Arl led an army of warriors and hounds deep into the forest. In this hunt for the werewolves he slew not only every wolf he came upon, but also every member of the chastened wilder folk. Any one of them, he said, could harbour a demon inside and thus be a werewolf in disguise. For twenty years the forest rang with the screams and the rivers ran red. The tales say an old chastened woman found all her sons all dead at the Arl's blades. She pulled one of these very blades from her son's heart and plunged it into her own chest, cursing the Arl's name as she did so. Where her blood touched the ground, a mist began to rise. It spread and spread until it was everywhere in the forest. The Arl's army became lost and it said they died there. 
Others say they wander still. The ruins of his Arling stand to this day, filled with ghosts of women waiting eternally for their husbands to return. The Forest of Legend is, of course, the Kakari Wilds. There are many legends about this great southern forest, as there are shadows, or so the saying goes. The chase and wilder folk have made it their home there since mankind first came to these lands, and the wild land spread as far into the south as anyone has ventured. Beyond the mists are vast tracts of snow, white capped mountains, and entire fields of ice. It is a land too cold for mankind to survive, yet the chase and eke out an existence even there. They tell horrors of beyond the wilds that the lowland folk could not begin to comprehend. To most, Ferelden simply ends with the Kakari Wilds. There is nothing beyond. The wilds is simply a land of great trees, wet marshes, and dangerous monsters. What more need be said? From Land of the Wilders by Mother Aelis, Chantry Scholar, 918 Dragon. Is also where uh, Flammoth comes from, the uh, Kakari Wilds. Probably w where half the uh, stories come from as well. The Wounded Coast. One of the few roads leading into Kirkwall passes through a dangerous area known as the Wounded Coast. The road winds close to the cliff edge that looms over the waters, with many a uh, uh, precipitous, precipitous drop to the churning waves below. Uh, there's many a local legend involving travellers falling or jumping or having been flung from those heights. From the cliffs, the road leads through jagged hills that line the walls like sharp teeth. Bandits use these hills as cover uh, from which to ambush caravans. There is more fear here than bandits, of course. Once one leaves the hills, you come upon a maze of sharp canyons, the hunting grounds of many fierce creatures. It is a place of secrets dating back to the golden age of the Venture Empire, where the ancient relics and statues crumbled in time with the rocks. More from Brother Jenna TV. That's us finished places. Uh, I'm going to take a break, but the video will continue on and we'll go into lore. Right, let's get started with lore. Adventures of the Black Fox. Born Lord Remy Vaskell in 863 Blessed. The Black Fox was a dashing thief and rogue who went on to inspire many tales of his exploits that are nearly impossible to determine today which are true and which are merely fabricated legend. Despite coming from nobility, he has become something of a hero to the common people. His initial exploits involved ridicu uh, ridiculing the tyrannical and powerful Lord of Val uh, Chevin. Wearing a mask, he would appear in public and disrupt the Lord's plans to the point where the Lord would angrily put out a large bounty on the life of this cunning fox, the origin of the nickname which stuck. The, that, primary, that the primary bounty for a uh, hunter who took the job, Carolus, ended up being becoming Remy's lifelong partner in crime, only after nearly killing him several times, is one of the most popular tales told in taverns today. The story is often exaggerated to make Remy appear initially buffoonish until Carolus become so furious at the Black Fox, uh, Fox's inexplic inexplicable ability to survive that the, the cunning Remy gains the upper hand, which impresses Coriolis so much that the bounty hunter joins him. After years of terrorising the Lord's men and foiling his tax collectors, a favourite pastime of Remy's according to the Elysian commoners, Remy was supposedly betrayed by his lover Severus de Montfort, in some versions of the tale a mage of the circle no less, and captured. After more than a year of torture, Remy was rescued from the prison by his compatriots, including a repentant Servana. And together they escaped or lay. In this period of Remy's adventures, he appears om uh, almost everywhere in Thedas. As his legend grew, more innkeepers and merchants were happy to claim the Black Fox had visited their villages or establishments and performed some legendary feat. If the tales are to, believe, uh, to be believed, Remy led the Lord's army on a merry chase. He became embroiled in political intrigue in Navarre, was hunted by the crows of Antiva, and then kidnapped by a powerful mage into Winter. In each situation, Remy escaped death at the last moment, followed, foiled the evildoer, and improved life for the poor and downtrodden. Then, inevitably, he rejoined his band of adventurers, moved on to the next land. His companions, Carolus and Servana, uh, the wise dwarf Bolic, and the temptuous knight uh, Sir Clement. Uh, Clementis, is that Clementis? Uh, have spawned their in own individual legends over the year. Years. The stories all agree at some point the Black Fox disappeared. He and his fellow adventurers voyaged into the heart of the Arlathan forest, seeking the sunken temple of the elves, and never returned. Many more are the tales that expand on 
uh, and what ultimately happened to them in the forest and, post and uh, postulate on how they could somehow be rescued. From the Adventures of Black Fox by Gaston Geralt, 9-11 Dragon. Interesting. Now, uh, very, like, it, it's a very minor Inquisition spoiler. There's a lot of talk about a fox, uh, like, I think there's a god that takes the form of a fox in Inquisition. And you hear more about it in a sunken temple of the elves. Maybe, if you know who the fox, if you know what the, I'm talking about, then you might know where I'm going with who I think the fo uh, black fox is. But yeah, that could be interesting. History of the Chantry, Chapter 1 The first blight devastated the Tevinter Imperium. Not only had the Darkspawn ravaged the countryside, but the Tevinter citizens had, fa ha had to face the fact that their own gods had turned against them. Dumat, the old god once known as the Dragon of Silence, had risen to silence the world, and despite the frenzied pleas for the help, ra the uh, other old gods did nothing. The people of the Imperium began questioning their faith murdering priests and burning temples to punish the gods for not returning to help. In those days, even after the devastation of the First Blight, the Imperium stretched across the known world. Fringed with the uh, barbarian tribes, the Imperium was well placed for invasions and attacks from without. Fitting then that the story of the downfall begins from within. The people of the far northern and eastern reaches of the Imperium rose up against their powerful overlords in the rebellion. The Tevinter Magister summoned up demons to put down these small rebellions, leaving corpses to burn as examples to all those who would dare revolt. Their Imperium began to tear itself apart from, uh, from within. Throngs of angry and, of angry and disillusioned citizens doing what centuries of opposing armies could not. But the Magisters were confident in their power, and they could not imagine surviving a blight only to be destroyed by their own subjects. Even after the blight, Tevinter commanded a, an army larger than than that of any organized nation in Thedas. But the army was scattered and its morale dwindling. The ruin of Tevinter was such that the Alamari barbarians, who had uh, spread their clans and holds over the wilderness of the Frelden Valley at the start of the south, at the far uh, southeast of the Imperium, saw weakness in their enemy, and after an age of oppression, embarked on a campaign not only to free their own lands, but to bring down the mighty Tevinter as well. The leaders of that blessed campaign were the great barbarian lord Mathareth and his wife Andraste. Their dreams and ambitions would change the world forever. Interesting. Interesting. So that's, um, you could almost see how if, what you think of, um, maybe Andraste, if she wasn't, uh, like, godlike, or like, the messiah kind of character, you could see how some like it could uh, be twisted because they're killing the Tevinter Imperium, who are the biggest. Like they are to control everything, and then Andraste's bring freedom, that sort of thing. Anyway, the tale of Eloran. In the days after the rising of Zik of uh, Zazakil, the Dark Ones covered every corner of the land. The Archdemon drove all the nations of the world before him: Shemlin and Elavan. Al alike. In the far north, where the hills wander the plains and the earth is eternally baked beneath the uncaring sun, the lands of uh, the lands which the Shemlin call Anderfels, a clan of her people, lived, struggling to survive the blight. Aloran was their keeper, a hunter in his younger days, as crafty as any wolf, as he led his people, uh, as he led he led his people always just ahead of the darkspawn who chased them. But the hunt, old hunter knew that even Hala cannot run forever, they must turn, fight, or be run down. At the foot of the Muradin, the Dark Swan cornered Illyron's clan. That night, the moon was strangled by clouds, the earth concealed by a dread mist that rose out of nowhere so the elven could not tell them, they could not tell up from down. In the confusion, the Dark Swan attacked. But Loren had prepared for them. All around the camp, the hunters had strewn dry grass, brush, and brambles when the sound of rustling foot uh, falls began. Eloran and the other Harharan called upon the old magic. They struck out with lightning and called bolts that, uh, and called and threw the bolts, missed the dark spawn and hit their, all the targets. All wait, they struck out with lightning, and though the bolts missed the dark spawn, they hit their targets all the same. 
sea of kindling lit, and not one of the dark creatures made it through the fire to reach the Lawrence land. Well, that's pretty smart. Written by Zathrian, uh, as has been passed down from Keeper to Keeper for generations. And Zathrian is the Keeper you meet in uh, Origins. Death of a Templar. The dry, dusty earth swallows up uh, salty drops that splatter its surface. A tiny insect pauses, sensing the vibrations, and scurries off, leaving behind its invisible enemy. As the drop falls, the dark circle emerges together, expressing a mirror of the creator. The primal emotions of bloodlust and sorrow blend into a lethal cocktail that breaks the strongest of men. The jurisdiction of, st of strength must be left to the spirit, not arm nor chest. Only the wisest turn to his inner sanctuary to partition the mind from all consuming magic. Uh, madness. Seductive voices whispering the promise of glory, w uh, waiting down the weaker path of the flesh, bringing a death far worse than that of hot lead or steel. These blank, hollow promises will echo the unfathomable eternal, uh, eternal, in unfathomable eternally. Living comfortably amongst uh, material possessions, it's easy to misunderstand the true meaning of uncontrollable hate. Failing to understand the power of fighting against pure, unfaltering beliefs in souls that only listen to their soul. Uncontrollable hate, influenced and thus removed from innocence, the scar is permanent and eternal. The rain, now red, feeds the debt owed for actions past, seeking further into the earth as, mind, as the mind draws slower. What was that drew him to the situation? The mind ebbs and parts to a lingering memory of true and innocence. He enters war as a newborn enters the world, unknowing of both the horrors and the light of the maker that will save him. The sound of metal sliding along leather comes from above him. The second he was born to this uh, soon-to-be dying breath, his mind was processing and analysing knowledge and experiences. It is true he thought he could be wise in his own eyes, but only the most humble recognises that he knows very little. Bias, speculation and all of false pretenses makes... Um, make way to the sound of sweeping steel, and finally his soul, as ready as his eye, dry from this final understanding, enter his promise of its purest form. That made very little sense. Uh, from Death of a Templar by Sir Andrew Knight of Andraste. A study of the Fifth Blight, Volume 1. While some of my contemporaries dispute whether the Fifth Blight was a true blight or merely a large dark spawn resurgence, historians agree that it began in the swamps of the Kakari Wilds on the southeast border of the Ferelden in 930 Dragon. King Caelan Thurin was, swiftly, was swift in responding to the threat, gathering the royal army, every Grey Warden in his country, and calling for... and uh, calling... and sending a call of, for aid to the Ferelden nobility. The assembled armies laid a trap in the ruins of Ostagar, hoping to cross the ruin, uh, the forest before it reached civilization, but they failed. Darkspawn overran the, defendment, the defenders of Ostagar and decimated the king and his army. They continued to advance into Ferelden unopposed. Only two Grey Wardens managed to escape the slaughter and somehow they came into possession of ancient treaties, which compelled the races of men to join arms against the, ma uh, the massing horde. The su uh, surviving uh, wardens made their way to Kinloch. Uh, hold, home of the Ferelden Circle, and conscripted the mages. In desperation to find more allies, the Wardens journeyed into the Brazilian forest, seeking the Dalish. The elves too joined the growing army. Into the deep roads, the surviving Wardens went searching for a paragon Branca and hoped she could settle the unrest in or Orzammar and unite the dwarfs in the battle against the Archdemon. Branca could not be located, but another paragon was found, the legendary uh, Caradin, who forged a crown that ended all questions of succession. Pyril Haramont was crowned King of Orzammar, and the Dwarven armies marched for the surface. Despite their success, though, greater challenges were yet to come. See, this shows bias well in is Sister Petrine again. It's always Sister Petrine. This is uh, the story of what happened in Origins. And it shows that the Chantry wasn't really willing to believe it was a blight, like many people weren't willing to believe it was a blight. Anyway. The Maker's First Children. The Maker's first creations were the spirits, glorious beings that populated the many spires of the Golden City, and the Chant of Light says that they revered the Maker with unquestioning devotion. The Maker, however, was dissatisfied. Although the spirits were like him, in that they could manipulate the ether and create from it, they did not do so. They had no urge to create, and even when instructed to do so, possessed no imagination to give creations 
ingenuity or life, and make her realize his own folly. He had created the spirits that resembled him in all but uh, the one and most important way. They did not have the spark of the divine within them. He expelled all the spirits out of the golden city and into the fade and proceeded to his next creation, life. The maker created the world and all the living beings upon it, separated from the fade by the veil. His new children would be unable to shape the world around them and thus would need to, to struggle to survive. In return for their struggle, the maker gave them the spark of the divine, a soul, and he watched uh, with pleasure as his creations flourished and showed all the ingenuity that he had hoped for. The spirits grew jealous of the living and coaxed them into being, uh, coaxed them into the fade when they slept. The spirits wished to know more of life, hoping to find a way to regain the maker's favour. Through the eyes of the living, they experienced new concepts, love, fear, pain and hope. The spirits reshaped the fade to resemble the live uh, lives and concepts that they saw, each spirit desperately trying to bring the most uh, dreamers into their own realm so they could vicariously possess a spark of the divine through them. As the spirits grew in power, however, some of them became contemptuous, contemptuous of the living. These were the spirits that saw the darkest parts of the dreamers. Their lands were places of torment and horror, and they knew the living were strongly drawn to places that mirrored the dark parts of themselves. These spirits questioned the maker's wisdom and proclaimed the living in fear. We learned from the darkness they saw and became the first demons. Rage, hunger, sloth, desire, pride. These are the dark parts of the soul that give the demons their power, the hooks they use to claw their way into the world of the living. It was demons that whispered into the minds of men, convincing them to turn from the maker and worship false gods. Their seats possess all life as uh, their due, forging kingdoms of nightmare in the fade, uh, the hopes of one day storming the walls of heaven itself. The maker despaired once again, for he had given the power of creation to his new children, and in return they had created sin. From The Maker's First Children by Badner, Senior Enchanter of Ostwick, 812 Bless. The Kirkwall City Guard. It is with pride, I, your Viscount, grant the authority of law and civil enforcement upon the guardsmen of an independent Kirkwall. No more shall uh, will we defer to the will of foreign troops or draw a holy order into task unbefitting of their mandate. These proud men and women will be people uh, will be of the people and will enforce the laws that we have elected for a civil and ordered society. And should the spectre of invasion return, the noble guardsmen will conscript from the populace, uh, population who will, um, for who better to amass the people's will than the constables of law charged with its inspection. This is a great day, Fair Kirk. Well, I'm honoured to appoint the first guard captain. Long may he serve the will of a free people. From Elysian legacy, how institutions of the oppressors linger, and speeches of Vicart Michael uh, Lafayette, collected by Phalum, a bard. I don't know why that has an exclamation mark, but a bard. Okay. History of Kirkwall, Chapter 1. It is difficult to comprehend today, but there was a time when Kirkwall was believed to be the very edge of the world. It was, imperious, it, it was imperious then, named after the founder Magister Imperius Craven, and was built and was but one outpost on the fringe of the Dementor Imperium. There, the Magister serfs worked in quarries for the jetstone needed to for the mighty temples of Minrathus. After a slave rebellion nearly burned the temple to the ground in the great city, it was determined that for a centre of slave trade would need to be it was determined that a centre for the slave trade would need to be established well away from the more civilised parts of the Imperium. Though this, may account, although this account may be exaggerated since the notorious Archon Venerius Isar narrowly escaped assassination at the hands of an elven slave at the time. Uh, ooh, I went too far down. Because the new slave outpost would become wealthy beyond imagining, competition among prospects reportedly took over 20 years to resolve, resulting in great bloodshed in the frontier, well away from the Archon's eyes. Magister took arms against Magister, mostly in the form of small armies of serfs and mercenaries. Over half of the slaves in existence allegedly died in these battles before Emerius was eventually chosen, thanks to the marriage of Craven's son to the Archon's daughter. Within a mere decade, the mighty fortress was erected on the cliffs where Kirkwall now stands. Over one million slaves passed through its gates before the Imperium eventually fell, an unimaginable number by today's standards. The Craven family itself became patrons of the next three Archons, and was one of the driving forces behind the extension of the Imperial Highway into the Ferelden Valley, a move that would cost them considerable political influence after the 
resistance of the Alamari tribes. During its height, Amarius was jeweled to rival the mightiest of imperial cities and the greatest center of civilization outside Tevinter. By Brother Genetivi again. History of Kirkwall, Chapter 2. As the Imperium's borders slowly receded after devastation of the First Blight and subsequent barbarian invasion, many outposts in the area known today as the Free Marches were cut from the centres of power. Numerous warlords tried consolidating the region into a single kingdom, but resistance prevailed. Emerius held out for almost a century until it fell to a slave revolt in 25 Ancient. It was not the first such revolt Emerius had suffered, but it was the last. It started when an Alamari slave named Radun began earning popularity in power by pushing for better conditions. Radun's glowing influence prevented the magistrates from touching him, but eventually they had him poisoned. Furious, a group of Radun supporters stormed the gallows and were massacred, and so began a bloody year-long rebellion. The city burned and wealthy Hightown was sacked. The magistrates hung before cheering crowds. Amarius assumed the new name of Kirkwall, Kirk meaning black after its jetstone cliffs. The new city plunged into anarchy for over a decade and its defences fell in ruin. Kirkwall has been conquered many times since and the city's own independence suffering since the freeing of its slaves. Alright, the slaves took over kind of in a rage, but there was nobody who had a plan to, uh, like, get a new form of government going or anything, so it just fell apart. The Servants of Divine uh, Renata I the weakening of mortal will is the greatest failing of all the Maker's children. We trade our honour as if it was the cheapest of currencies. We do not understand what integrity is or how it is truly worth. From this ignorance, original sin was born. At some time, each of us has thought, what does it matter if I keep hold of my integrity? I am but one mortal. I am powerless. How blind are we all? How blind we all are? The virtue of a single slave destroyed the Deventer Interium. This honour of one man drove the Maker from our sight. I tell you truly, nothing but the integrity of our hearts will win the love of the Maker back to us. It is all the power that we shall ever possess to change the world for good or for ill. From Sermon on Integrity. Uh, Vaseline Blood Writing. After my encounter with the Dalish Elves on the road to Navarra, I studied every book on the Elves I could find. I sought out legends, myths and the histories and tried to make sense of it all. But there's only so much one can learn from books. I knew that in order to truly understand the Dalish, I would have to seek them out. A dreadful idea in hindsight. But in my defence, I was young and also inebriated when the idea popped into my head. Unfortunately, even after I had regained some measure of sobriety, the idea still held appeal. It proved remarkably resistant to my attempts to ignore it. I gave in after months of nagging uh, thought at the back of my head and started to learn about the Dalish first hand. I tramped through the forest bordering early for weeks until I eventually found or was found by a Dalish hunter. I stumbled into one of his traps and was suddenly sent hanging from a tree with a rope about my ankles. So there I was, defenceless upside down with a rope over my head, my underclothes on display. Descriptions of my predicament might elicit laughter these days, but trust me when I say it was a situation I would not wish on anyone else. Thankfully, my ridiculous appearance may have caused my captor to stay his hand. What threat is a silly human with his pants showing? So he sat, made a small fire, and began to skin a deer he had caught. I soon mustered the courage to speak. I tried to assure him there was, uh, tried to assure him that I was not there to harm him, but he laughed at this and replied that if I was going to harm him, I had failed miserably, terribly. I eventually we got to talking, and when I said talk, I mean that I asked him questions in case he would deign to answer. He told me that while some dailies actively seek out human travellers to rob or frighten, most of those people would rather be left alone. He seemed to believe that punishing humans for past actions only led to more violence. I asked him about the uh, intricate tattoos on his face. He told me they were called Vaseline, blood writing. His were the symbols of Andril the Huntress, one of the uh, most highly revered elf elven goddesses. He said the dailies mark themselves to stand out from humans, and from those of their kin who have chosen life under human rule. He said, he said the Vaseline remind his people that they must never surrender their beliefs. When f he finished skinning the deer, he cut me down. By the time I had righted myself and conquered the dizziness of the blood rushing out of my head, he was gone. I do not recommend that my readers seek out the Dalish for themselves. I was lucky to have met a man that I did and that I walked away from our meeting unscathed. Perhaps the Maker watches over those who seek knowledge with an open heart. 
I so I would certainly like to think so. More Brother Jenna TV. The Amel family. So the Amel family is uh, Hawk's family. It's truly sad what happened to the Amels, isn't it? I still remember Grandmother talking about the balls that Lord Aristed used to hold at their estate in the Antivian violin and to the dancers from Asf Asana. No expense was spared and no one would ever dare miss it, at least someone think they weren't worthy of an invitation. And then poor Rekfa had the child. Magical talent running in one of Kirkwell's most prominent families. The Templars considered Lord Aristed to be Viscount after Theronhold's arrest. Can you imagine the scandal had he been chosen? They whisked the child away to the circle, and the Mel's simply had no luck after that. Leandra ran off with her Ferelden mage, then Damien was accused of smuggling. Poor Lord Falstein bankrupted his family trying to get the charges dropped, but I hear Viscount Marlowe simply wanted their Mel's out of the picture. It worked, didn't it? By the time Lord Falstein got sick, there was only young Gamlin left, and a mountain of debt. I spoke to uh, Dulcie just the other day, and apparently Gamlin is now living in some low-town shack. Sounds like the sort of character you'd cross the street to avoid, and let's, let's not even talk about the estate. Mother says she should remember the Amels, because that sort of thing could happen to any of us. You know the old saying, March's fortune rises and falls with the tide. You ask me, this is just another misfortune that magic brings to honest folk. And Drasty helped that poor family, whatever lies in store for them. Excerpt from a letter written by Lady Amel de Montfort. So, the way it looks in the game, when you're playing, it looks like Gamlin gambled away the entire fortune, but this sounds like Gamlin was paying off the debts of uh, his father. So it's, uh, maybe Gamlin is, is like more of a product of his situation, of like his, uh, situation rather than Gamlin being the cause of his situation. The City Elves When the holy exalted marches of the Dales resulted in the disillusion of the Elven Empire, the uh, Elven Kingdom, leaving a great many elves homeless once again, the Divine Renetta declared that all lands loyal to the Chantry must give elves refuge within their own walls. Considering the atrocities committed by the elves at the Red Crossing, this was a great testament to the Chantry's charity. There was one condition, however. The elves were to lay aside their pagan gods and live under the rule of the Chantry. Some of the elves refused our goodwill. They banded together to form the wandering Dalish elves, keeping their old elven ways and the hatred of humans alive. To this day, Dalish elves still terrorize those of us who stray too close to their camps, most of the elves, however, so it is wisest to live under the protection of humans. And so we took the elves into our cities and tried to integrate them. We invited them to our homes and gave them jobs as servants and farmhands. Here in Denerim, the elves even have their own quarter governed by an elven keeper. Most are proven to be productive members of society, still a small self, uh, segment of the elven community remains dissatisfied. These troublemakers and malcontents roam the streets, causing mayhem, rebelling against authority and making general nuisances of themselves. Oh look, it's uh, Sister Petrine, the, ba the biased uh, person who I'm thinking might be a little bit racist. Anyway, Arlathan. Part 1. Before the ages uh, were numbered, or named or numbered, our people were glorious and eternal, never changing. Like the great oak tree, they were constant in their traditions, strong in their roots and reaching for the sky. They felt no need to rush when life was endless, they worshipped their gods for months at a time. Decisions came after decades of debate and an introduction could last for years. From time to time our ancestors would drift into century-long slumber, but this was not death, for we know they wandered the fading dreams. In those ages, our people called all the lands Elevin, which the old language means the place of our people. At the centre of the world stood the great city of Arlathan, a place of knowledge and debate where the best of the city elves would go to trade knowledge, greet old friends, and settle disputes that had gone on for millennia. But while our ancestors were caught up in the forever cycle of ages, drifting through life at what we thought, at what we today would consider an intolerable pace, the world outside the lush forests and the ancient trees was changing. The humans first arrived from Parlavalon in the north, called Shamlin or Quicklinks. By the ancients, the humans were pitiful creatures whose lives blinked by an instant. When they first met the elves, the humans were brash and warlike, quick to anger and quicker to fight, with no patience for the unhurried pace of elven diplomacy. But the elves brought worse things than war with them. Our ancestors proved susceptible to human diseases, and for the first time in history, elves died of natural causes. 
what's more, those elves who spent time bartering and negotiating with humans found themselves aged, aging, ten tainted by the humans' brash and impatient lives. Many believed that the ancient gods had judged them unworthy of their long lives and cast them down amongst the, the quicklings. Our ancestors came to look upon the humans as parasites, which I understand is similar to the way humans see our people in the cities. The ancient elves immediately moved closer, uh, close to Elevan, off from the humans, for fear that this quickening effect would crumble the civilization. The fall of Arlathan is called by Gesharl, keeper of the uh, Ralafarin clan of the Dalish elves. So you see, this gives the elves a great reason to hate the humans to start with. Is like they, they they were killing the the elves without even knowing it. So this could kind of be the start of the um, the hate, the kind of mutual hatred. Arlathan Part 2 You asked what happened to Arlathan? Sadly we do not know. Even those of us who kept the ancient lore have no record of what truly happened. What we have are accounts of the days before the fall and the fable of the whims of the gods. The human world was changing even as the elves slept. Clans and tribes gave way to a powerful empire called Tevinter, which, and for reasons we do not know, moved to conquer Elevan. When they breached the great city of Arlathan, our people, fearful of disease and loss of immortality, chose to flee rather than fight. With magic de uh, demons and even dragons at their behest, the Tevinter Imperium easily marched through Ar Arlathan, destroying homes and galleries and amphitheatres that had stood for ages. Our people were con corralled as slaves and human contact quickened their veins until every captured elf turned mortal. The elves called to their ancient gods, but there was no answer. Uh, as to why the gods didn't answer, our people left only a legend. They say that Fenharel, the dread wolf... Oh, I was wrong earlier. It wasn't a fox, it was a wolf. Never mind. A lord of tricksters approached the ancient gods of good and evil and proposed a truce. The gods of good would remove themselves to heaven, the lords of evil would exile themselves to the abyss, neither group ever again to enter the other's lands. But the gods did not know that Fenharel planned to betray them. By the time they realised the Dread Wolf's treachery, they were sealed in their respective realms, never to interact with the mortal world. It is a fable, to be sure, but these elves who travel beyond uh, the beyond claim that Fenharal still roams the world of dreams. He can watch over the gods, lest they escape from their prisons. Whatever the case, Arlathan had fallen to, uh, to the very humans our people had once considered mere pests. It's said that the Devinter Magisters used the, greatest, uh, the great destructive power to force the very ground to swallow Arlathan whole destroying aeons of collected knowledge, culture, and art. The whole of elven lore left only to memory. Uh, again, this is by the same elven keeper. Uh, oh, still got quite a lot left in lore. Okay. Dillish elves. In, its, in time, the human empires will crumble. We've seen it happen countless times, and until then we'll wait. We keep to the wild borderlands, we raise Hala, we build our bells, and we present a moving target to the humans around us. We try to keep hold of the old ways and we relearn what was forgotten. We call to the ancient gods, although they do not answer and have not heard us before the fall of, uh, since before the fall of Arlathan, so that one day they might remember us. El Elgarnan, the eldest of the sun and he who overthrew his father, Mithral the protector, Fenharel the dread wolf, Andril the huntress, uh, Falandin the friend of the dread, Durhamen, Durhamen, the Keeper of Secrets, Gilhanane, the Mother of the Hala, Jun, the Master of Crafts, and Silies, the Hearth's Keeper. The Hearth Keeper. We gather every ten years for the uh, Arlaven to retell the ancient stories and keep them alive. For when the human kingdoms are gone, we must be ready to teach others what it means to be elves. Okay, Enigma of Kirkwall. The Viscount is suspicious, but the bribe was sufficient to gain access to restricted sections of the Archive. The money would have been better spent elsewhere, but the Archive is being almost devoid of Imperium era records. When the slaves revolted, they hunted, they hunted magisters and burned the city, at least parts that could be burned. One account says that the streets were littered with piles of scrolls and books set aflame. There's a quest for you tell. Did the slaves destroy the answer? As Maratheth's armies toppled the Imperium, they sent three magisters and their legions here. They never arrived, but why did March here all, of all places? What were they coming here for? Behind a, man, a panel with curious marking signed Band of Three. It is as we thought. The quarries of Kirkwall were founded after the city was, uh, was sacked by the Imperium. 
and they started constructing the city. The Imperium found mineral wealth, but not the indigenous people. The histories gave conflicting accounts of who lived here before the Imperium. Some say the Alamari, some say the Daphians. We do not know that it was uh, we do know it was a barbarian people who had little need of the metals in the hills. So why did the Imperium come here in such force? It is hard to disprove Brother Mikhail's theory that the natural harbour would be important for their enemy for their armies, but the magisters ruled not uh, not common people. What barrier would a simple sea pose to them? The wars with the Alamari wouldn't start until centuries later. Each clue we find leads to more questions, but we do not give up. Underneath a pile of small boulders, carved with curious markings, signed Man of Three. In the back alleys of Low Town, you can find extraordinary things. Priceless tomes of knowledge can be bought for a handful of gold. The chant of Archon Lovis, the whole chapter of the Midnight Compendium, some of those books were thought lost forever. And these are no forgeries, I've verified their authenticity myself. The fences have no inkling what they're selling has value. Where do these books come from? After several failed attempts, I got my answer underneath the city. There was a hive of secret passages in Kirkwell's sewers. And then a lucky sewer rack comes across an unlooted chamber, and then a cache of ancient Tevinter relics spreads across the black market. We must search below the city. Underneath a cobblestone with curious markings faintly glowing, it's signed the Band of Three. Ooh, so there might be loot underneath the city? Great to know. The Lomarian Accords. Fifty years. That's how long it took the Imperium to drive out the Canary occupation, but the rest of the Northern Thedas was not so lucky. Both divines, black and white, declared the exalted marches, and this for the only time since the schism of the Chantry they worked together. A century long siege resulted with the giant Canary entrenched in Antiva and Rivian, and all of Thedas throwing armies against them. The war drained the resources of every nation in Thedas, leaving most on the brink of collapse, for the giants did not appear to, uh, to be the damage to their armada or the loss. For the giants, it did not appear to be the damage of their armada or the loss of their soldiers, but the terrible toll upon the Rivian population that prompted their retreat. When the third new exalted march had all but massacred the people of Contar without even chipping the Canary, um, without even chipping the Canary occupying force, the giants finally withdrew. The treaty that put an official end to the Canary Wars was signed at the politically neutral island of Lemurian, off the southern coast of Rivian. 150 years after the assault on the mainland began, the Canari left our shores. They received the northern archipelago in exchange for a cessation of hostilities against nations on the Accord. Only Tevinter refused to sign, and so the war continues to rage in the Imperium to the present day. It is worth noting, however, that the Kingdom of Ravain immediately violated the treaty, twice. Once when the humans uh, of northern Ravain, nearly all practitioners of the Kun and thereby by definition Canary, refused to leave their homes and go in exile to the islands. And again, when the Ravain Chantry and Nationalist forces, unable to convert his people back to the worship of the Maker, tried to purge by the sword, slaughtering countless unarmed people and burying them in mass graves. It's fortunate the mysterious uh, it's a fortunate mystery that the leaders of Contar did not alert the allies in Northern Passage, or we'd still be fighting the giants now. Hmm. Sister Petrine again. Hmm. Okay. Oh, we get to hear about uh, crafting materials now. Death root has been used as a magical and potion making has been used in magic and potion making for centuries. It's a fragile looking plant with thin stalk and purple flowers, and it uh, fruit which fruits once a year, developing bright red fleshy pods that cause disorientation and dizziness if ingested. There are two varieties. The more common uh, arcanist death root was found by Archon. Hadrianus, when he discovered that it growing on several dead slaves. The other lunatic, lunatic's death route is most closely associated with the story of Cortesian uh, Melusine, who sought revenge on a powerful magister and his family. She harvested the plant, baked it into small pies for the magister's banquet, and presented them to the magister at a banquet. All the guests were seized, seized by terrifying hallucinations after eating the pies and tore each other to pieces. Deep. Mushroom. Deep mushroom can uh, refers to the entire group of fungi that grows underground in, ca in caves and parts of the dwarven deep roads. Collection can be a dangerous task as the deep roads are often infested with dark spawn. Because of this, dwarven merchants often recruit castless hirelings for the job and pay them a meager percentage of what they are selling the mushrooms to surfacers. The most common varieties used in herbless trade are the blight cap, ghoul's mushroom, and brimstone mushroom. Almost all of which carry the darkspawn corruption. 
While they cannot transmit the disease, this trait will make them quite poisonous. Deep mushrooms should only be handled by experienced herbalists and should never be consumed without first being adequately cleaned and prepared. Careless consumption has been known to cause insanity, severe abominal cramping and even death. Elfruit Elfruit was first used by the elves of Arlathan, <laughs> hence the name. The root gave, uh, gave their medicines particularly efficient, uh, particular efficiency, so when the Imperium conquered the elves, magisters adopted its use and popularity spread to all corners of the Empire. All fruit is a hardy plant with large green leaves that grows wild in many places. It's so common it tends to show up in even gardens and fields, almost like a weed. Unlike a weed, however, most people appreciate having access to the wonderful little plant. The roots can be used with very little preparation, rubbing uh, some of the juice onto a wound, for example, will speed up healing and numb pain. And chewing on a slice of the root tends to um, treat minor ailments like indigestion, flatulence and horse throats. There are many varieties, but most useful for herbalists are the bitter, gosmere, and the royal elfruits. Uh, Embryum. Embryums are flowers of the orchid family. Its therapeutic qualities are actually discovered because of the embryum's exceptional beauty. The beautiful daughter of Lord Ignis Ponce of uh, Orlais fell victim to a terrible sickness of the lungs, which her healers were unable to cure. Then the girl would soon perish. Her parents surrounded the bed with brightly coloured flowers, hoping that they would be able to bring some warmth and cheer in her last days. Oddly enough, the girl began to recover from her illness and grew stronger each day. Her parents were baffled but overjoyed. The healers eventually learned that the fragrance was one of uh, one of the flowers eased the child's breathing. The flower was an embryo, this being known as a Salaberis embryum. Now the variant that a uh, the other variant has certain magical properties known as Dark Embryum. Glitter Dust Glitter Dust is a powdered f uh, form of rock found along the wounded coast. When explorers brought the sparkling rock to the markets of the free marches, it became immediately popular amongst the wealthy ladies who crushed it and applied powder to their faces. The added brightness and luster to the skin, however, soon paled in comparison to developing rash and coughing fits. As it turned out, glitter dust is dangerous if ingested or inhaled. It's also extremely flammable, as several ladies discovered after powdering their hair while standing near a candle. Unfortunately, this resulted in a dozen deaths by conflagration. These days, glitter dust is used sparingly and only by experienced alchemists. The most common form of the substance is a volatile glitter dust. Volatile glitter dust. I've gathered from caves where the dark one dwell, uh, dwell the rock produces a powder known as tainted glitter dust. Or a calcum. Like lyrium, orichalcum is a metal most commonly encountered in liquid form. Unlike lyrium, however, orichalcum forms pools and must be drawn like water rather than mined. Deep orichalcum is the most common form of the metal, as far as been found in a place where opal was mined. The rare crystalline orichalcum is found in small pools in the mountains. Um, in the mountains, folk wisdom says that the drop of orichalcum mixed with wine is a potent Afri aphrodisiac, though it has a pungent smell similar to lye so I could not bring myself to put the legend to the test. Uh, excerpt from Alchem uh, Alchemical Primer of Metallurgy, Volume 1 by Lord uh, Circus of Marnus Pell. Silverite. The, lust the lustrous white-blue silverite has long been prized by dwarves for use in jewellery, rune-making, and weaponsmithing. But on the surface, it is more commonly used by the apothecaries and healers. Since the metal does not rust, in many traditions it has been believed to be proof against poison. There is a tale passed down amongst the people of the Anderfils. A knight returned home after many years of war only to be struck by an adder. His wife immediately bound the wound with a medallion of silverite pressed against the bite like a poultice. By the morning the poison had left him and the knight lived to an old age. Spindleweed it is an old country saying that spindleweed grows best for the sorrowful. Verdant spindleweed in a household's garden has often brought neighbours considering uh, offering a consolation, often without asking what might be wrong. This originates from the plant's use as seasoning for dishes meant to speed the recovery of the infirm. A person who grows much of it is likely caring for the fatally ill. Okay, looks like we're done. Oh, uh, we've got a few more things to do with... Um, crafting materials, but looks like mostly done for them. Canari. Uh, Atis Tal Eb. When the Ashkari looked upon the destruction of, uh, wrought by the locusts, by locusts, 
He saw at last the order in the world. A plague must cause suffering as long as it endures. Earthquakes must shatter the land. They are bound by their being. As this talibid, it is to be. For the world and the self are one. Existence is a choice. A self of suffering brings only suffering to the world. It is a choice and we can refuse it. An excerpt from the Kun Canto 4. The Canari Cerebaris. The Kun teaches that all living things have a place and a purpose, and only when they're correct, they're in the correct place and in control of their own self when they attain balance. When the balance is lost, suffering follows. Mastery of the self is therefore the first and greatest duty. Those born with magic are at a terrible disadvantage, for demons can always rob them of themselves. Because of this, the Canari named them Cerebaris, meaning dangerous thing, and treat them with the utmost caution. Cerebaris must be carefully controlled by something else, an Aravad, one who holds back evil, because they cannot truly control themselves. The evil is not the mage, but the loss of the mage, the loss of the mage itself, the suffering that inevitably follows. The Canari pity and honour the Cerebaris, for striving under the constant threat of, from within is truly selfless, which is the highest virtue of the Kun. Okay. Interesting. The Canari. The people of the Kun are perhaps least understood group in Thedas. The Canari Wars were brutal, but so was the Chantry Schism. So was the fall of the Imperium. Some of the misunderstandings and accident of nature. The race we call Canari are formidable. Nature has given them fierce horns and strange eyes and the ignorant look on them and see monsters. Some is the ancient, uh, the accent of language. Few among the Kun's people speak the common tongue, and few, fewer speak it well. In a culture that strives for mastery, to only have a passable degree of skill is humili humiliating indeed, so they often keep quiet amongst fall among fo foreigners out of shame. But most of it is a result of the culture itself. The Canari view their whole society as a single creature, a living entity whose health and well-being is a responsibility of all. Each individual uh, is only a tiny part of the whole, a drop of blood in its veins. Important not for itself, but for what it is to the whole creature. Because of this, the Canari most outsiders meet belong to the army, which the Kun regards as if it was a physical body. The arms, legs, eyes, ears, things that the creature needs in order to interact with the world. One cannot get to know a person solely by studying his hands or his foot, and so one cannot truly meet the Canari until one has visited their cities, and that is where the mind and soul dwell. In Saharan and Parvalin, one can truly see the Canari in their entirety. There, the unification of the Canari into a single being is most evident. The workers, whom the, the Kun calls the mind, produce everything the Canari require. Uh, the soul, the priesthood, seeks a greater understanding of the self. The world exhorts the body and mind to continually strive for perfection. The body serves as a go-between for the mind, the soul, and the world. As every everyone and everything has a place, decided by the Kun in which they must work for the good of the whole, it is... A certain, it's a life of certainty, of equality, and if not, inv individuality. Okay, so can I have an interesting, uh, like, uh, religion? Well, I mean, technically, Canari are any followers of the religion, but it's, it's interesting. The Raiders of the Waking Sea. The Raiders of the Waking Sea, or simply the Raiders, is the common name given to an association of Antibian pirates called the uh, Felicima Armada. These pirates were once little more than opportunists based out of the coastal city of Lomeran that preyed on sea traffic. They were often targeted by our legion and free marcher cities that were bent on destroying the pirates once and for all. After such effort, new pirates would appear to fill the vacuum. During the new exalted marches, the nations of Thedas needed every ship they could muster against the massive power of the Canary Dreadnoughts. The Lomerian pirates were faced with a difficult decision. They had to band together under one flag and fight with those who had previously preyed upon or faced conversion or annihilation by the Canari. Their armada was formed and pirates brought their knowledge of stealth and trickery to bear, plaguing Canari's uh, supply lines and even launching seaborne invasions against the Canari coast. For a time it was said the armada was the uh, premier naval power of Thedas, and after signing of the Lemurian Accord they maintained their association rather than disband as many had hoped. Wealthy merchants now pay the leaders of the armada rather than risk their ships commandeered, and the merchandise stolen and then sold on the black market. The armada is hardly unified, but and bloody battles between the armada leaders are frequent. 
but when faced with an attack from an outsider as the group instantly puts aside their differences and closes rank. The Raiders have thus become more of a threat in the last century than they ever were before. There was a legend told about how a dashing and romantic life aboard a Raider vessel is, but don't believe it, there are scoundrels and smug uh, smugglers, all of them. The Dowager's Field Guide to Good Society by Leader Lady Alcyon. Okay. Uh, surface Dwarfs. In Orzammar, Dwarven society is divided into rigid castes with houses that compete for power and prestige. But that is all discarded when a dwarf abandons the stone for the surface. Under the open sky, everyone is equal. Or so the story goes. The truth is... Th um, oh, that glitched down a little bit. The truth is, thousands of years of tradition are not e so easily tossed aside. Even though surface dwarves are officially stripped of their caste, many maintain a hierarchy amongst themselves along the old caste lines. Formerly noble houses are accorded more respect than castless brands who came up in search of opportunity. The poorest noble dwarf on the surface looks upon the rich lowest caste dwarfs with contempt. The upper class surface dwarf society is roughly decided, divided into two camps. Kalnas, who insist on maintaining caste and rank, typically those from noble or merchant caste families, and ascendants who believe that leaving Orzammar traditions underground and embracing life in a sunset world, sunlit world. Maintaining some ties to Orzammar was seen for generations as the only lifeline for surface dwarfs. Bringing surface goods to their kin underground, lyrium and metals to the surface was not only the most lucrative means of making a living, but also a sort of sacred duty. As many surface dwarfs willingly accepted exile and loss to their caste to be better serve their house or their patron. In recent years, many surface dwarfs, particularly ascendants, have branched out. They started banks, mercenary companies, and overland trade caravans. They became investors and speculators in a purely surface trade. These new industries have proven tremendous sources of wealth, but have looked down upon by the most more conservative kin. For less affluent surface dwarfs, association with powerful Kalna can open many dwarfs. They can doors. They can get. Uh, credit with Dwarven Merchants and are offered uh, work opportunities by the powerful Dwarven Merchants Guild more readily and sometimes more qualified uh, but less connected individuals. Uh, from Dwarven, uh, more, more from this field guide. Interesting, so um, like the surface Dwarves are kind of people who are trying to hang on to the traditions because that would give them power or people who are like, nope I was castless and I'm going to uh, Go and live my life as a surface dwarf, and I'm going to be successful that that way. It's kind of cool. Talvashoth. Being lost in ancient Devinter ruin in northern Rivian is highly overrated. And I found myself beset by a band of Canari, apparently working in concert. I fled and managed to hide in a little village by the name of Vindor. The people there, mostly humans and few elves, were devout followers of Kuhn. It's the most organised village I've ever laid eyes on. The houses were identical and arranged along perfectly orthogonal lines. The fields were well tended and apparently communal. But there were signs of damage everywhere as the town suffered from repeated sieges. Buildings shattered, fields burned and a great many empty houses. I spent the night in the home of Vindar's matriarch who introduced herself as a Seer. When I tried to regale my hostess with tales of my canary assailants, I discovered something. Canari, Seer said, are people who follow the Kuhn. Are people, those born into Canari society who reject the Kuhn, are called Vashoth, meaning Grey Ones. Those Grey Ones must leave their homes, for they have no place amongst the Canari. Sadly, many turn against the society that cast them out. Those outcasts call themselves Tal Vashoth, the true Grey Ones. Often they have no skills to make an honest living, they, so they sell themselves into service, usually becoming mercenaries. Even most inept fighters amongst the Canari race pro, uh, possess prodigi pro prodigious size and intimidating visage. These, she informed me, were my attackers in the court countryside, the same band that wreaked havoc on Vindor. Natalvashov waged bitter war against the Kuhn, the Canari, and sometimes against order itself. They are no match for the Canari army, so they generally strike at farms, travellers, and those who stray too far from the Canari connection, uh, protection. I was lucky to escape with my life, Brother Genetivi. Sorry, I just want to see how much we have left. Uh, quite a lot. I'm going to take a small break here. Slavery in the Zephinter Imperium. Slavery still thri 
thrives in Thedas even if the trade has been outlawed. Who hasn't heard tales of poverty stricken elves lured into ships by prospect of well paying jobs in Antiva, only to find himself slapped in leg irons once at sea? And humans fall prey to this too. If they're lucky, they end up in our lay, which only has servants. Most nobles treat them decently because they are afraid to, um, of admitting the truth. But legions go to great lengths to maintain the fiction that slavery is illegal. Of course, the greatest consumer of slave labour is the Tevinter Imperium, which would surely crumble if not for the endless supply of slaves from all over the continent. They... There, they are uh, meat. Chattel. They are beaten, used as fodder in endless war against the Canary, and even to serve as components in dark magic rituals. From Sister Petrine. A Cotier. A Coterie. A Kirkwall is built on a solid foundation of greed and hum on human suffering. And its underworld is a place where everything is for sale and everyone is fair game. There are many terminal empires in within the city, some of which uh, have been around since the Imperium used Kirkwall as a hub in the slave trade. Um, alliances, spying, manipulation, betrayal and open warfare is all commonplace in the never-ending struggle for power. The Coterie is a thieves guild that has been around for almost a century, but until recently was never a major player in the underworld. Some 20 years ago the strongest uh, of the local criminal uh, empires was an ancient guild known as the Sabarinth. Its leader was, was uh, Sabarathan. Sabrathan. Sabrathan? But its leader was betrayed from within, and during the turmoil the Coterie made a successful grab for power. Since then, we've stuck those laws into almost every level of Kirkwall, including the City Guard, the Dwarven Merchants Guild, and some of the most influential citizens in the city. It's safe to say that the Coterie gets a slice of every pie, and very little goes on Kirkwall that escapes a notice. Uh, it goes on Kirkwall that escapes a notice. Have we met the Coterie yet? I don't remember meeting them, but maybe we did, because we've got this Codex entry. The Grey Wardens. The first blight had raged for 90 years. The world was, at ca was in chaos. The, a god had risen, twisted and corrupted. The remaining gods of Tevinter were silent, withdrawn. What writing we have recovered from those times is filled with despair, for everyone believed for the greatest archons the lowest slaves that the world was coming to an end. At Wise Up Fortress in the desolate Anderfels, a meeting transpired. Soldiers of the Imperium, seasoned veterans who had not, known nothing their entire lifetimes other than hopeless war, came together. They left Wise Up and then renounced their oaths to the Imperium. They were soldiers no longer. They were the Grey Wardens. The Wardens began an aggressive campaign against the Blight, striking back against the Darkspawn, reclaiming lands given up for uh, for lost. The Blight was far from over, but their victories blo uh, brought notice and they soon received aid from every nation of Thedas. They grew in number as well as in reputation, finally in the final ye uh, year, finally in the year 992 of the Imperium into Winter Imperium, upon the Silent Plains, they met the Archdemon Dumat in battle. A third of all the armies in Northern Thedas were lost in fighting, but Dumat fell and the Dark Swan fled back on the ground. But that was not the end. The Imperium once revered seven gods, Dumat, Zekiel, Toth, Amharal, Razakael, Lucas, Luzakan, and Urmathal. Four have risen as Archdemons. The Grey Wardens have kept watch throughout the ages, as well as the... Uh, well aware that the peace is fleeting, and that war continues to rage until the last of the Dragon Gods is gone. Uh, Sister Petrine, I know you were having issues earlier, but that that would be five of them have risen. Have risen. There was a fifth blight. But anyway, yeah, yeah. She she doesn't believe there was a fifth blight for some reason. We we heard that earlier. And Raste, Bride of the Maker. There was once a tiny fishing village on the Waking Sea that was set upon by the Tevinter Imperium, which enslaved the villagers to be sold in the markets of Minrathis, leaving behind only the old and infirm. One of the captives was the child Andraste. She was raised in slavery in a foreign land. She escaped and made the long and treacherous journey back to her homeland alone. She rose from nothing to be the wife of an Alamari warlord. Each day she sang to the gods, asking them to help her people who remained slaves in Tevinter. The false gods of the Imperium of the mountains and the wind did not answer her, but the true god did. The maker spoke. He showed her all of the works of his hand, the fade, the world, the creatures that they're in. He showed her how many men had forgotten him, lavishing devotion upon mute idols and demons, and how he had left them to their fate. But her voice had reached him and captivated him that he offered her a place at his side so that she might rule all of creation. Andraste would not forsake her people. She begged the Maker to return, to save his children from the cruelty of the Imperium, but reluctantly the Maker agreed to give the man another chance. 
Adrasia went back to her husband, Matharath, and told him all of the Maker had revealed to her. Together they rallied the, they rallied the Alamari and marched forth against the Mage Lords of the Imperium, and the Maker was with them. The Maker's sword was creation itself, fire and flood and famine and earthquake. Everywhere they went, Andraste sang to the people of the Maker and they heard her. The ranks of Andraste's followers grew until the vast tide washing over the Imperium. When Mathraf saw the people loved Andraste and not him, a, war a worm grew inside his heart, gnawing upon it. At last, the armies of Andraste and Mathraf stood before the very gates of Menrathus. But Andraste was not with them, for Mathraf had schemed in secret to hand Andraste over to Devinter. For this, the Archon would give Mathras all lands to the south of the Waking Sea. And so, before the armies of the Alamari and Tevinter, Andraste was tied to a stake and burned while her earthly husband turned his armies aside and did nothing, for his heart had been devoured. But when he watched the power of the Archon softened, he took pity on Andraste and drew his sword and granted her the mercy of a quick death. The Maker wept for his beloved, cursed Mathras, cursed, uh, cursed Mathras, cursed mankind for their betrayal and turned once again from creation taking only Andraste with him. And Our Lady sits at his side where she still urges him to take pity on his children. Yeah, this shows the other side of how you can take the Andraste story. So it's, you could, uh, like, you can take it as her seeing the Maker, or you can take it as they walked on Minrathus and there was a series of nature events that may have uh, affected it. It depends. An honest answer regarding apostates. A mage who does not receive the teachings of the circle and who does not have the words of Andraste in his heart is an apostate and a dangerous to, to us all. Without the guidance of a holy chantry, the mage may foolishly dabble in darker arts, blood magic or demon summoning, thus becoming Maleficarum. A mage's mind will ever be a doorway to spirits of the Fade. Without proper instruction, this doorway remains open and unsecured. If a demon should come through this doorway and possess a mage, an abomination is created. Abominations know only madness. They cannot be reasoned with and will slaughter man, woman, and child without thought. Whole cities have fallen to these creatures, thousands have died at their hands. The Chantry and our Templar have a duty to ensure this does not happen. If I knew a better way to deal with magic, I would seize upon it immediately. You say we should let the mages guard themselves. I tell you that is no solution. Look at the Deventure Imperium. The Magisters do not know a strain. Without the Chantry oversight, the Magisters abuse their power. Those without magic are trampled under foot and forced to serve and forced to serve. Slaves are slaughtered by the hundreds to feed the magisters hunger for power. Even some mages are not spared for uh, mages, as in all humans there exists a spectrum. On one end the very powerful, on the other those that can barely light a candle. The empire cares only for the strongest, and for those who do not compare favourably are thrown to the wolves. Imagine your children growing up in such a world. If a mage asked it of you, would you give him to your would you give him your daughter, not knowing what his plans for her might be? You could not resist him, and neither could she. Without our Templars and without the Circle, the common man would have no defence against magic. We must deny the mages certain freedoms for the common good. I wish there was another way. I tell their princess this is a test of their faith and that the will of the Maker. Many understand. We do what we do for their own good. Hmm. So this is a Grand Cleric's point of view. But yeah, it, mages are a difficult situation because they, they do turn into, a pot, uh, into abominations, but it does seem a bit like uh, mean to actually go and imprison them but it's like how, how, how do you get around that the commandments of the maker of these truths the maker revealed to me as there is but one world one life one death there is but one god and he is our maker they are sinners who have given their loves to false gods magic exists to serve men and never to rule over them foul and corrupt they are who have taken his gift and turned it against his children, and they shall be named Malificurum, accused ones, and they shall find no rest in this world or beyond. Um, all men are work of his maker's hands, from the lowest slaves to the highest kings, and those who bring harm without provocation to at least his, to the least of his children are hated and accused by the maker. Those who bear false witness and deceive others know this, there is but one truth, all things are known to our maker, and he shall judge the lies. All things in this world are finite, and... What one man gains, another has lost. Those who steal from their brothers and sisters do not harm our livelihood and the peace of mind. Our maker sees this with his heavy heart. Transfigurations 115. The maker, there was no word for the heaven or the sky or the sea or the for the heaven or for the earth, for the sky sea or the sky, for existed for all that existed was silence. 
Then the voice of the maker rang, ran out, the first word, and his first word became all that might be. Dream and idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. He made it from the first one, he said to them, In my image I forge you, to you I give dominion. Over all that exists by your will may things be done. In the centre of heaven he called forth a, a city with towers of gold, streets of music for cobblestones, and banners that flew without wind. There he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. The children of the Maker gathered before the golden throne, sing sang hymns of praise unending, but their songs were the songs of the cobblestones. They, sh they, shone, they shone with the golden light, they reflected the Maker's throne, they held forth banners that flew there on their own. And the voice of the Maker shook the fade, saying, In my image I have wrought, my firstborn, you have been given dominion over all that exists, by your will all things be done. And yet you do nothing by the realm I have given you is forming ever changing. And he knew he had wrought a miss, so the Maker turned from his firstborn and took from, uh, took from the fade a measure of its living flesh. He placed it apart from the spirits and spoke to it, saying, Here I decree opposition to, in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer, for darkness, light. The will alone is balanced, sundered, and the world is given life anew. And no longer was it formless, ever-changing, but held fast, immutable, with words for heaven and earth, sea and sky. For the maker from the living world make men immutable as the substance of the earth with the souls of the dreams of the idea of hope and fear, endless possibilities. And the maker said to you, my second warmer grant this gift, your heart shall burn, an unquenchable flame all-consuming and never satisfied from the fade I craft you, from the fade you shall return, from each night you need dreams that you might always remain, remember me. Then the maker sealed the gates of the golden city and there he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders the children would create. Etherinodus 518 the founding of the Chantry. Uh, Cordelius Draken, king of the city-state of Orlais, was a man of uncommon ambition. In the year minus 15 ancient, the young king began construction of an ancient temple dedicated to the Maker. And declared by its completion, he would not only united the warring ancient states of the, si of the south, he would also have brought Andrastian belief to the world. In negative 3 ancient, the temple was completed there in his heart, Draken Knelt before the eternal flame of Andrastium as crowned ruler of the Emperor of, of the Empire of Olay. His first act as Emperor to declare the Chantry as established Andrastian religion of the Empire. It took three years and several hundred votes before the Olysis of Montsamard was elected to lead the new Chantry. Upon her coronation as divine, she took the name Justinia, in honour of the disciple who recorded Andrastia's songs. In that moment, the ancient era ended and the divine era began. Hierarchy of the, chan of the Circle it is no simple matter safeguarding the ordinary men for, from mages and mages from themselves. Each circle tower must have some measure of self-government for the maker's will that men be given power to take responsibility for our own actions to sin and, for fa and fail, as well as to achieve the highest grace and glory of our own strength. You who will be tasked with the history of the circle, of protection of the circle must be aware of its workings. The first enchanter is the heart of any tower. He will determine the course the circle will take and he will choose which apprentices may be tested and made full mages. You will work most closely with him. Assisting the first enchanter will be the senior enchanters, a small council of the most trusted and experienced magi in the tower. From this group, the next first enchanter is always chosen. Beneath the council are enchanters. These are the teachers and mentors of the tower, and you must get to know them in order to keep your finger on the pulse of the circle, for the enchanters will always know what's happening amongst the children. All those that have passed their harrowing may not, uh, but have not taken apprentices as, ma as mages. This is where the most troubled circle lies. Uh, in idleness and inexperience of youth. The untested apprentices are the most numerous decisions of any tower, but they pose the most threats to themselves due to the lack of training than anyone else. Knight Commander Sirin of the Chantry Templars in the letter to his successor. His successor. Uh, I'm actually going to stop this. We'll call this part one. We have done nearly all of the lore. We've done creatures, items, place, nearly all of the lore. So we've got half the lore, we've got characters, letters and notes, and a singular note from Grey Warden Letters. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.